have some form of low vision. And this group is often socially excluded. They have high rates of underemployment and unemployment. And it's a growing group because we're all getting older and many of the conditions which cause visual impairments are age related. Okay, so historically, making large uh, general purpose paper dictionaries visually accessible has been a challenge. You've got this problem of a limited page count, but a great deal of information to cram into this space. So how do you do this? Small font sizes, italics, dots, dashes, tildes, other um, space-saving conventions, all of which are particularly difficult for people with visual impairments to perceive. Happily, uh, new with new technology, we have new opportunities. So online dictionaries have fewer space limitations than their traditional counterparts. That's not to say there aren't space limitations. There obviously is a limitation in presentation space. And they allow the use of assistive technology. So things like magnifiers, screen readers, which is software which displays or reads the text, which is displayed um, on screen to sighted user using a computer synthesized voice and things like refreshable braille displays which are little devices like this which represent the characters on screen as in braille characters. So along with these new technologies we have initiatives to improve accessibility things like the web accessibility initiative and along with these, we have things like the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which is a set of recommendations for making web content, web pages, web apps, things like that, more accessible for people with disabilities. These are accompanied by technical solutions. So things like uh, ARIA labels, which is code on web pages and web apps, which identifies interactive elements. So here you can see, uh, this is from the old version of Medium Webster, but the menu item has been identified so that when a screen reader encounters it, uh, it tells the user they need to interact with it. So the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines are a series of 13 guidelines aimed at improving access to websites for people with disabilities. And they're organized around uh, these four key principles. So information needs to be perceivable. So uh, we can't assume that users only have uh, ha only have one sense. Um, we can't assume that users are able to read the uh, see the images. So we need to make sure they can things can be perceive be perceived using different senses. Websites need to be operable uh, using different means. So, for example, screen reader users often use the keyboard to navigate websites. So it's no good having a a website that can't be oper that can only be operated using a mouse. Things should be understandable. Information should be understandable. Um, in lexicography, what's really important, particularly in bilingual lexicography, to identify the language used on a web page or parts of a web page so that this can be read and pronounced correctly by a screen reader. And things need to be robust. So it's no good having a website that, uh, that breaks a screen reader. It's no good having a screen reader that breaks a website. So really importantly is the idea of success criteria. And this is a great strength of the accessibility guidelines because it allows us to test and quantify how accessible websites are. And these are sorted into three conformance levels, ranging from A, the minimum standard, to triple A, the ideal. The double A level is basically the de facto goal, the de facto standard and the legal requirement in, in uh, some countries. So these guidelines have been used to investigate the accessibility issues in existing online dictionaries. Blanca Arias Badia and Sergi Toner have a forthcoming paper where they've used the key principles perceivable and understandable as a framework at, in a top down approach to analyze websites. Uh, 
in my recently published research, I took a bottom-up approach going from dictionary websites to success criteria to the key principles, and I quantified uh, the accessibility of three dictionary websites. So between the two studies, we've covered about seven dictionary websites. Most of these are monolingual, or all of these are monolingual resources. They're in Spanish or English, just because of our backgrounds. In broad strokes, um, suggestions for making visually accessible dictionaries that came out of these are using text labels for images and forms, making design adaptable, taking care with color and contrast, and facilitating effective navigation for screen reader users. Or that is users who navigate with the keyboard and not the mouse. So I'm going to give some examples of each of these using text labels. Here you can see the search bar from the uh, Diccionario de la Lengua Española. And you can see consultar here, search. It's not an image, it's written as text. So this means it can be read by the screen reader. This is great. Here in Collins, the search icon is a magnifying glass, but it is accessible because there's alternative text here, uh, which stay in search. So the screen reader user can perceive this. Again, these labels don't have to be um, visible to the naked eye. Here's an example from Merriam-Webster where they're using ARIA labels to label the interactive elements. So this is good practice. This is really good. Unfortunately, there are some elements on dictionary websites that require the, site, the sense of sight to use. So this is a slider menu from the Collins uh, website last June. And um, these circles at the bottom allow the user to, to move the menu across. Now, they're not labeled with text. The user who doesn't have the sense of sight would have no idea how to operate this website. It's, it's inaccessible or this part of the website, rather. Making design adaptable, well, this is to do with changing the size and the spacing of text. Um, the general rule for the size of text is that it needs to be, be able to zo be zoomed to 200% without becoming distorted. So again, the um, Diccionario de la Lengua Española does this quite well. There's a little distortion here, but nothing major. The new version of the Miriam Webster not so well, but this is an improvement on the last version. As far as contrast and color is concerned, the minimum contrast ratio between foreground and background should be 4.5 to 1. To put that in context, a black text on a white background or white text on a black background is about 21 to 1. So if, you, if you're meeting this criterion, that's great. But unfortunately, not all websites are doing it. So on Medium Webster, this here's an example of um, an illustrative uh, example, which even with this really expensive projector is quite hard to perceive. There's, there's not enough contrast difference between the foreground and background. So facilitating navigation for screen reader users well this is basically about labeling parts of the website so you'll see here that the search box is labeled we've got things like this which are regions of the page because when you're navigating with a screen reader uh, users will typically press d to skip to the next region or they'll use things like heading levels to skip down to the next heading level to encounter the part of the website they need so this is pretty well done. There's some problems we'll see later, but this is not so well done because a user who encounters this web page uh, will probably look for a heading. And the first heading they come to is this word of the day thing and this, this Twitter feed here, which is probably not what they're looking for, right? So they actually miss out the dictionary entry completely. So my solution, and a possible solution, is EdictViz. It's basically a, a visually pared down dictionary website, which displays content from Medium Webster's using um, an API. And the previous research, in my previous research, I quantified the sources of unmet success criteria, so the parts of web pages that cause problems for users. 
And as you can see, a great chunk of these problems came from advertising on web pages. So this is not a commercial endeavor. We can get rid of that. Don't even have to consider it. Lexic attainment. So these are things like word games, word of the day things, uh, mailing lists, blog posts are often included just to increase the bounce rate of a page. So that's the amount of time a user spends on the page, which is a key metric for advertisers. So the longer a user spends on the page, the more attractive it is to advertisers. So again, with the design philosophy of, think, of paring things down, keeping things as simple as possible, um, we don't really need to consider that because we're not a commercial enterprise. So this leaves core lexicographic, and by which I mean issues affecting the microstructure, things like context and color, text manipulation, abbreviations. Abbreviations are really important in dictionaries, but they're quite inaccessible. If abbreviations must be used, uh, the full form of the word should be given as a, an alternative text. And design, well, that relates to the structure of the page inside. So the use of headings, labels for the regions of page, text inputs, and keyboard operability. So to develop the website, I used an agile methodology, or I'm using an agile methodology rather, which is a series of uh, a process of prototyping, feedback, further prototyping in quick succession. So the, the aim for the first version was a basic working prototype. Today I'm going to talk about versions two and three, and the aims for this is to pass automatic, automated evaluation and pass manual inspection. To put that in context, Access, uh, accessibility evaluation with web content accessibility guidelines generally takes uh, place in two stages. We have the first stage, which is automated evaluation, and we use tools such as these. It's generally recommended to use two or three of these because they tend to give uh, false positives and negatives. They scan through a web page, pointing out potential issues with uh, with the web page for people with visual impairments uh, or with uh, with uh, many types of disabilities, in fact, and and highlight these. This is followed by manual inspection, uh, where a user navigates through a web page and ticks uh, a checklist of success criteria. So, uh, if they find an image which is unlabeled, uh, that would be an unmet success criteria. So. Version uh, 0 0.2 uh, was the, the aim was to have a version that passed uh, automated evaluation. And as you can see from the first column here, there was only one instance of an unmet success criteria. And in fact, this was a, a false positive. So we went to manual inspection of version 0 0.3. And the policy of keeping things as simple as possible seems to be vindicated here because only 33 of the 53 possible success criteria relevant to lexicographic resources are actually apparent on the edict viz page. And only one of these is unmet and it's the bypass blocks rule, provide a skip to content links. So this is an easy fix, right? We just add a skip to content link. So ostensibly, we have um, a compliant dictionary. But what does this mean in practice for the user? Well, without empirical testing, we can't really say. But just to give you some idea, uh, I asked a friend of mine who's a screen reader user to look up the word salve in Collins Online Dictionary and then with EdictViz while I screen record it. Um, and he's a B2C1 level English user, a native speaker of Catalan and Spanish. Um, I knew he wouldn't know this word and he didn't. So let's have a look at the screen recordings. Collins Online Dictionary Definitions, Thesaurus and Translations Document, Banner Landmark, English Dictionary Edit Required Selected Sarve. Sarve Banner Landmark. English Dictionary Edit Required Selected Sarve. D. 
selection room. He's in the search he's box here because button. he's looking for the, the landmark frame. The landmark. Missing image descriptions. Open the context menu. Unlabeled graphic link. So the adverts here are causing a great problem because they haven't been labeled with alternative text. So he's completely lost. At Definition this stage. of SAR heading level one. Okay, he's using the headings here to navigate. SAR heading level two. It's here. Clickable share. So these Click clickable channel. share icons are a great feature, Word but they're really confusing to occasionally. Screen reader users. SAR is one of the 30,000 most commonly used words in the Collins. This is a really good practice. This uh, frequency indicator, which is visual for us, has been rendered in text for him. So it's, Dictionary. it's good practice. It's Clickable totally acceptable. Share. Heading level two SAR. Link powered by Cobuild. Sile clickable pronunciation for Sarv link graphic IPA pronunciation guide. USC clickable pronunciation for Sarv link graphic IPA pronunciation. Link graphic guide. It's a frustrating Word process, words, eh? Plural. Third person singular present tense Sarv's clickable pronunciation for Sarv's. Participle Sarv in clickable pronunciation for Sarving. He could have skipped Sarv forward, but he lost. If you do something to Sarv your link conscience. You do it in order to link feel less link guilty dot. Right, these links are great. This cross re cross I give myself great for us, but really difficult for my conscience. Link verb noun clickable auto generated. Oh. All right, you get the idea. It's difficult, right? Let's look at edict viz. Removed. Edict viz, a visually accessible dictionary website. Banner landmark skip to content link. Search landmark. Search word edit oh, title. There's lots of landmarks here. Blank. He knows where he is. S A L V E. Search button. Navigation landmark list with four items. Dictionary link current so page. He knows here. He Main knows landmark SAR one heading level two. He used the headings to find the entry. Word class. Noun. There's no abbreviations. Everything Definition is of pros. cleaning substance that you put on a wound to heal it or to make it less painful. He's looking for the verbal sense. Sarv 2 heading level 2. Okay. Word class. Verb. Definition to make something less painful. Used in context. List with two items. Bullet the lotion. Sarv the okay, lift bullet the grape. Bullet the flower. Okay. So you can see it's a smoother process, right? It's not an experimental, it's not in experimental conditions, but it's a smoother process. So what I want to do now is, on the, for further evaluation, is a usability study, comparing this with a regular uh, online dictionary and using a standardized measure like the system usability scale, maybe with some screen recording and think aloud protocols. And obviously I'd like to see how this affects um, language performance, maybe like a vocabulary game. I'll probably concentrate on academic vocabulary. So just the final slide here, just to sum up. Well, so far the process has provided a panorama of the visual accessibility of existing online dictionaries and a nascent accessible resource in edictviz. But I think that's not the most important thing for me. I think what I really want to do is to uh, generate debate and provoke debate about the best way to make lexicographic resources accessible for, di for disadvantaged users and more generally talk about the challenges of how to visualize lexical data in general. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, you can check out our prototype at edictviz.com. It's behind um, a password, but if you drop me an email, I'll give you a password. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, interesting talk. Uh, first, I have a, a small announcement to make. Uh, we are expected after this session in the ballroom for the group uh, photograph. So if you would uh, go there afterwards, in the ballroom downstairs. Downstairs. Oh, where the party was last night. Oh, there, was, okay. there was a party. Uh, downs uh, downstairs, yes. Mm. Any questions? Yeah, thanks very much. This was really uh, inspiring. And as a, as, a, as a dictionary website developer myself, I'm really happy that you didn't test any of my websites that <laughs> I built because I'm not sure what the result would be there. <laughs> um, 
I want to ask you whether you have any uh, suggestions or ideas for helping uh, maybe screen reader users for navigating not only the entire web page, but specifically the individual entries, because dictionary entries are extremely complex yeah. objects. They have yeah. so much internal structure. I always wonder how do screen reader users even kind of navigate from one sense to another? How do they quickly locate the sense they're looking for, especially if it's a complicated entry with yeah. a hierarchy of senses and subsenses and things like that? I'm completely lost for even, I don't even know where to begin thinking about I, this. I mean, the first thing we have to do is kind of check our expectations of what is possible. It's always going to be difficult, right? It's, it's a visual medium that's being represented orally. Um, the good thing is that um, we have this, I don't know, 30, 40 year old technology, HTML, which has heading levels, uh, ordered lists, and um, read, I think, uh, and ways of, ways of um, labeling regions on pages. And I mean, in the entry itself, if you can use heading levels where possible, uh, there's an argument for saying that we should label each section using ARIA labels. So that would be read to the, like, for example, in this Collings thing, I think they used an ARIA label to describe the the frequency of the verb. So there would be text not visible to the um, sighted user, but tells the person with the visual impairment where they are in the entry, I guess that would be helpful. The problem is that in the last 30 years or so, as you know, web pages and web programmings got infinitely more complex, right? And um, um, a lot of the, a lot in a lot of um, frameworks, this kind of stuff is not implemented. It, it was much easier to do it when you just had simple HTML, but now you've got CSS, um, all these huge frameworks that are much, in this sense, much more difficult to work with. The good thing is, is that there's lots of documentation out there. The problem is that when you're uh, trying to get something working, working to a deadline, you don't really have time to read all that documentation, think about it from that way. So this is my motivation, I think, for developing this website as a separate resource. Um, for many people in accessibility, this is not a good thing. They think that accessibility should be built into everything and not like sectorized. But I think being pragmatic about this, this is a neat solution. Um, I also think that perhaps a website's not the best way to go about it. Maybe a plugin, which would just could just um, change the source code, right? Just strip a lot of the superfluous information out would be easier to develop, but perhaps less robust in the sense that when the web page, dictionary web page changes, it wouldn't work anymore. Yes, uh, I just, well, more of a comment, because recently we, we went through this exact process. I mean, it, watching how a blind person is viewing our websites. And one thing that really uh, comes to mind is that when you are um, preparing a dictionary, normally the people who are involved in this process are not at these conferences. So I'm talking about designers yeah. and developers of the, of the dictionary websites. They are not there. And then you have to be careful whether they are aware of these sort of um, uh, guidelines. And, rel and we had, in our experience, was that the, the, the designers were, the programmers, or not, uh -huh. so the designers developed everything according to standard, then the developers put, and when the blind person was testing it, we got this like graphic, uh, just read nothing there or headings. So I think there would, there should be some awareness training, or I don't know for yeah, yeah. exactly the people that um, absolutely sort of program the dictionaries or the websites. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you once again for your talk. Thank you very and much. Now we have to rush. <laughs>